So, um, oh, thank, thank you, Mike. Um, um, feel free, everyone, if you want to just do your introduction in chat, that would be terrific. And so I'll go ahead and share screen and you can do a quick overview. Um, sure. And then we'll have um, Paula and Isabel from the Center, on, Center for Learning and Action talk. Does that work for everyone? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show the screen right now. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Here we go. And is it working? I can see it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All good. So okay. just so this is, I uh, wanted to report on initial themes that we're finding in a scoping review of literature that we've been conducting basically for the last year, um, which was part of the requirements of the grant. So we did a scoping review of literature. With the guiding question was, what's the state of the practice of education of healthcare professionals and what has been accomplished since 1990 in the development, implementation and evaluation of curriculum training materials and practices for healthcare and social services students and professionals, so on and so on, to address the health, mental health, well being characteristics and needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So it's a long statement. We picked 1990 because that was the ADA Act. Um, so, second slide. We, we used as our guiding framework to, for this uh, scoping review a six level socio ecologic model which was the base of which was the Bromf, is the Bromf and Brunner ecological systems theory. And that's a theory that looks like at how layers of an ecological system affect populations. So the sixth level one we use was, was the individual level, which would be things like we're the training program that might address personal behaviors, hereditary risks. In the case of healthcare professionals, it addresses the the knowledge and attitudes of healthcare professionals and health profession students. Relationships, which is the second level of the model, would be things like the relationship with health professionals, peers, families, caseworkers. In particular, what we found often in articles was discussion of communication uh, skills, et cetera, between healthcare providers or health professional students and persons with intellectual disabilities and their families and, and support uh, personnel. Organizations would be looking at things like clinics, community-based organizations. In particular, we, the things might, that might have been addressed in articles were things like policies and procedures of an organization, either attempting to change them or in some way be influ influence them, um, or things like, you know, you're trying to get a curriculum adopted by an institution or something of that sort at, at, at an organizational level. Community would be things like environmental factors, transportation, access to food, employment, that does in the, these interventions in any way might affect um, the ability to seek employment would be at a community level. Policy would be things like the ADA Act, Medicaid, SSI, so on. And society might include issues like ableism, systemic racism. So we, we, we had questions in our scoping review Qualtrics about what, what level was being addressed um, in the articles. We did, we found way more articles than we expected. So I, I don't know what happened to the slide, but it was uh, 4,571 articles total that were identified and reviewed. We did some reliability screening with uh, between two reviewers of about 20%. There were about 500 articles that were fully reviewed. Of the articles that would actually cut, we did pull policy pieces and surveys and so forth, but of the articles that specifically covered development and implementation of education training of health professionals or health profession students, more than 50% were at either levels one and or, or two and or both. So majority of these articles dealt with things like there was a classroom experience, some, like, you know, whatever, a course, a lecture that was addressing the uh, learning, the knowledge and attitudes of health professionals or professional students, and or, you know, communication skills often, or, you know, ability to communicate. Um, 
we have about 75 percent and, and you know the current trends in health professional literature uh, health workforce literature we really need to train healthcare professionals to work in teams we should have interprofessional education about 75 percent included only a single profession about 25 and other 25 percent two or more so um we determined that basically most of the literature was at a fairly low level um and would not kind of in many ways doesn't actually address where current thinking is going on what we need to do with the healthcare workforce. And our, so the next slide in our, so no next slide, maybe it didn't go through, but in we found emerging in our, uh, in the measurement and evaluation uh, can uh, consortium action network, when we discussed this, the recommendation was to review the literature for emerging themes. So certainly within those articles, there are probably a small number in, in each of these themes, but they did exist where specifically in developing a program, the social model of disability <coughs> and or civil rights perspective was taken in developing the, the work. Um, there were a few where they specifically involved persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities or family, more family than the persons with IDD, but in the design implementation, at least there were one or two where people were used as instructors and evaluators of students where they were partnered with rather than used. Beth is gonna get me on me. We part, they, well, there was a very good one I read where the, the <coughs> program had partnered <coughs> with people with intellectual disabilities as instructors in a course and it's actually in evaluating the students. Being not a single profession, uh, broader thinking on who is on a team. So there were some that were partnered with theater students that were health profession students, but partnered with theater students or lawyers, legal students, sociology students in developing a program. And also broader thinking of including DSPs and other community-based organization staff as part, of the, as part of the program and actually thinking, which in fact they are part of the healthcare workforce and then also using disability competencies as part of the evaluation. So we will be, and, and, and specifically also talking about ac community academic partnerships. Actually, most of the ones, I don't have the percentage right in front of me, were only based, uh, were like classroom based, very few involved any kind of clinical experience in the higher percentage than maybe worse, more than one profession, but that they included uh, some sort of clinical experience in the community. So that's, we will be working on those themes. Uh, the next phase for this review is what we call, it's gonna be call, called a participatory planning and decision-making phase where we will take what we find, uh, work with a group of stakeholders to prioritize the critical domains and subdomains of the themes. And it will be, then we will use the sort of findings of that participatory planning and decision-making in um, influencing the ongoing uh, development, because that's going on right now of IPE uh, curricular materials and practice experiences for uh, in regard to the health and healthcare of persons with IDD that will be rolling out in the fall. So that's my brief report. Any, any questions, thoughts? Hey, hey, so just to clarify, so when you said level one and two, does that refer to this slide with one and two? Yep. Okay. So what we found is most programs were addressing knowledge, attitudes, and maybe not and let fewer, but maybe also specifically addressing communication skills of healthcare professionals, okay. students or health professionals, but very little that addressed higher levels of the ecological framework. And so that, how much do you think that's in terms of ecological framework, in terms of social determinants of health, that it really just focused on the, the medical health care component? Yep. If you were to look at the, uh, like 80% of health care just takes place in the community, doesn't have anything to do with hospitals or clinics or formal health care, really. It, it should, but, it do, but it's really focused on that 20% that's the downstream factors rather than the upstream factors. Got it, okay. Thanks. Whereas, you know, Bromp and Brenner's thinking is sort of in many ways 
basis of the thinking on social determinants of health, that a lot of health is determined from the policy and societal factors and community factors versus what happens in healthcare. I mean, what happens in healthcare is also influenced by all that, but. Sarah. Yeah. Um, it, it, it sounds like, and, and, and I'm asking this as a question, it sounds like a lot of this is directed uh, towards, like you said, uh, maybe attitudes or policy or general information. Did you find much out there that, that is actually teaching clinicians about the specifics of medical care and like clinical type curricula? Um, you know, how to, how, to, how to take care of specific needs, how to look at behaviors in terms of uh, a way of communicating uh, health issues, that type of stuff. Some not, I, I, no, not, I don't think at the level that you're talking about, because yeah. I'm familiar with your program. I don't think at that level, no, not really. Just curious. And then know. very little where you had some where clearly, or position papers where they're clearly saying, and or this college, some of it was this college or this place should be adopting some kind of curriculum and they were trying to influence that and how they, you know, but a lot of it was then single institution, not broadly. Because I thought and that not was key. much on, um, and really we don't teach much. There was some that specifically they in core, included in whatever program they were developing was discussing social determinants of health and that kind of stuff, but not much. I thought that was a key component in the uh, National Council on Disabilities Health Equity Framework that they yep, just put out that they, they specifically mentioned clinical curricula they did. that needs to be included, which, which you know is really about teaching you know the professionals skills and, skills. and clinical skills to be able to to meet the healthcare needs of people with IDD. I thought that was an important component of that. Yeah, Thanks. more of it actually dealt with like sort of the general base of knowledge and improving that and general base of attitudes, but that whole, even that issue of being able to, that sort of skills piece and communication piece, which is even at that level too, yeah. I would say was not very high. Interesting. We'll, we'll have more when we complete the review and pull it, but I think you're right on that one. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have yeah. one that I'm concerned about because I actually went through it. I yeah. took a test for, you know, it's the test that they do for people who um, might be oh. meant that they want to know if you're mentally ill, you know, and you look at the ink blots and stuff. And they don't look at people who don't know how to read well, because I did that one test where it's got like 400 questions and you're supposed to figure out in, in there, there's certain ones that are similar, but if your brain's not set up to understand, you look like you're weird or bizarre because I came out that way. So in, in the sense, they one person said, you really can't fail it. And, but a lot of them said I failed because I didn't follow their norm of what they wanted, do you know? You know? And I don't know how you fail it, you know? But they want to know if you have mental problems or whatever. And then um, someone who's very artistic saw ink blots like then you had a full page and then other parts of the testing didn't make sense so they couldn't figure out you know they just knew I was weird and, and different but they don't know how to work with people that don't fit the norm of the testing so how do we look at that so we get the right kind of help that we need in you know in the teaching process because I know there's been articles on um for IQ testing that has been done incorrectly you know, and there's been other things that been where they could do it, you know, because everyone's got a certain way of doing it, but is it really the correct standard of what it originally was set up for? You know what I mean? And, and, and certainly, Heidi, there's a whole systemic society level ableist perspective, systemic uh, sort of systemic ableism that goes on in healthcare that influences all the other factors that below it, uh, which certainly also was covered um, in the health equity framework that Dr. Scude was talking about. But it's an important point. I mean, the system is set up to be kind of discriminatory and you've lived it. Um, but I, I would say there was, there's some of the literature that we found, I mean, we'll get deeper into these themes as we pull everything, but there was some literature that covered it. Uh, not a lot, I don't think. Because it is a very important I, point that you're raising. 
that because the reason I brought this up because they said I was crying wolf when I asked for help to read it and then only one person gave me it you know because I've done this a few times um not the 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 big um you know thing if you're mentally ill but that 400 question thing because I love to give that a lot to people who have meant you know thinking they're mentally ill you know and only one time they gave it to me on tape and the rest they made me read it and then they were surprised that my, I, if you're not taught certain things out through your disability life, how you're supposed to know, and then they look at you kind of funny, you know, or if your mom didn't teach you or your dad or the schools or in your environment. So it doesn't make sense with certain types of disabilities when they're, because I have seen Down syndromes, I've seen people with cerebral palsy, I've seen all sorts of people in the hospital. And sometimes I wonder if they're being diagnosed correctly or being put on the right kind of medications or if we're educating correctly because they thought I had tension deficit disorder when I really didn't. It was a whole different ballpark. It's just our brains don't fit the norm of what they they want, you know? So they are quick to medicate. And there's a whole article, Channel 2 in Minnesota, it's a public channel did a thing on this in the 80s where we love to self-medicate, but we don't want to work on the actual problems like we're talking about today at this meeting. So I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Can I um, make a comment on that? I think that's an excellent observation of the lived experience with this, and it demonstrates the ableism that Sarah is speaking uh, to the ableist uh, view in not discriminating between and distinguishing not discriminate, distinguishing between cognition, communication, and literacy, and literacy in the broadest sense in terms of health literacy. What are we doing in using our assessments to ensure that the recipient is able to understand, comprehend at the level that they are at and with the interventions that we could apply to then allow and enable someone to best understand what is asked of them and how do we equip them with that ability to use what um, they have in order to most accurately respond. And I think this is the issue with so many of our assessments and our interventions is that we're not looking at the sensory impairments, meaning hearing, vision, et cetera. We're not looking at the cognitive uh, assessments in terms of how well is this person able to comprehend what is being asked. We're not looking at the communication aspect of it, whereas we're, we're not looking at um, receptive expressive communication needs, and we're not looking at the literacy uh, issues in terms of at what level are we asking the questions? Are the, is the person able to understand what is being asked? And I, I think this is, you know, the bottom line in terms of many, many um, of the issues that are um, are there in terms of being able to, to best assess populations. I also think too, um, in terms of cognitive, a lot of times people don't realize that some individuals may present as being extremely capable. Um, their verbal scores are really well but they may have executive function issues that are underlying that unless those are really addressed, no matter what you do, um, it's, you know, whatever treatment is, is not going to follow through because they're not able to execute based on it. So you have to be very specific with them. So I think that's also something in the cognitive realm that is never uh, discussed. To, to answer your question, I actually looked at, I talk very smart, but if you around me 24 hours a day, you can see certain things like, oh, you have some reading problems, some writing problems, some, you know, figuring out certain things, you know, but at the same time, I've got the smartness that keeps me strong. And that's how I get on these committees and get on certain things and why I do what I do, because I like doing it. Not always, but I like it. But I've actually lived it and I've had professionals and say to me like, oh, you don't have, you know, just because you talk smart doesn't mean, look at Albert Einstein. He, they finally figured out that he may have autism because he couldn't do the basic things, but he could do science. 
basic things like dress himself, feed himself, you know, all the things that we have to do to survive. It was hard for him, but at the same time, he um, could figure out science. So did we go and punish him? No, because he did something cool. But people like me, we get, you know, punished sometimes or looked at upon in ways that are very inappropriate. So it's something to think about when we're doing our teaching and getting this out that we have to relook at. How, it's not just me that has to figure this out. It's also I need some help from you guys to figure it out too so I can be a part of the community. So it's something to think about as we are doing this program and this five-year grant. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, any other last comments before we move on to our uh, presentation from Paula Consolini and Isabel Averro at, um, oh, Suzanne has a hand raised. I missed a hand. Hello, this is Susan Riley. And um, as um, the other lady just said, because I already forgot her name, because I'm not good with names. Um, but I'm good with words and I'm not good with numbers. If someone asks me how old I am, I don't know. If you ask how old my son is, I know what year he was born in. So he was born in 1984. I don't know how old he is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to write the date. And that confuses people because I'm so good with words. I just, I put it in my problems and because people see one part just like the other lady said and then they assume that the whole thinking is just as good okay that's all okay yeah. thank you sir. It was, <laughs> thank it, you, this is Heidi that you that I am the lady that you are mentioning Heidi I'm the one with the picture you know so you can look at it and you know, with the buttons, so you know who I am. Oh, thank you, Heidi. Um, any other comments, questions before we move on to Paula and Isabel? Yeah. One thing I want to say before we end this little part that I think it would be really cool. My dad says my daughter might talk really smart, but she's always going to need help. And he, when he was alive, he would come to my meetings and say that so we can get the help that I truly need. Because sometimes the smartness gets lost in the picture. And, and it's great that Heidi's smart, my dad would say, but she always going to need help. Everybody needs help. Everybody has a disability, but that's not how the world treats certain things. So it's something to think about when you're doing your work and helping people and teaching and you know, whatever you do to make it better. Better could be a big word because everyone sees that it, a different way, but whatever you think, you know, thank you. Well, that's a good point. We all do need help. It's just oftentimes we look at the help that people with disabilities need as somehow unique and different, but, but really if we approach it from a universal design perspective, it would, it would just like ramps, it would benefit everyone. That, that's a great comment. Um, Heidi, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Paula and Isabel, I know you can share, and I think you were okay with um, doing your introduction. Um, just really briefly, we had a, yes, being a sister and, I, a sister <laughs> and I had an email from Isabel from William College a little while ago, and um, it, 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 looking to address health disparity in their local community. And we were so impressed with Isabel that we moved, moved forward to meet Paula, who's the director of the Center on Learning and Action, which we love that name too. <laughs> and um, coming, coming from a very different perspective, but launching off from where Sarah was and thinking about the different level and thinking about social determinants of health, and how from a non-health profession approach, how you all are making a difference. And I will let you take it from here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'll introduce myself, but first I want to try to make sure that I can get the first screen of the presentation going for you all. I think it's listed as an option. I could do this now. 
present tab to meeting. Oh, maybe it doesn't think we're at the meeting. The show screen at the bottom. Is it? Oh, I'm going to change. I'm doing it a different way here. So I, I went through the Google Meet. I'm going to do the share screen at the bottom. You're right. I'll do it that way to our meeting. Sorry, I haven't done this through Zoom in quite a while. Let me find the right tab where we are. Okay, good. Yes, there we go. All right. Thanks for your patience, folks. Speaking of needing help, <laughs> we, as we all do, as you say. We, we, are, we are all going to want to move to Massachusetts and join the other center <laughs> for learning and action when you're done. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Anyway, let's see. Come on, slides. How am I not getting this right? Um, it should be just the tab. I want to just show the tab. Sorry, guys. Um, Okay, I may have to go to our fallback with you. I thought I could share it through there. Um, Did you all I wanna do is share the tab to my screen and it's not, why it's not doing this, I don't know. It's telling me maybe I can't. Google okay. Chrome. Can you or Isabel send it to or email I, me? Can yeah, I, I could send it through the chat, I guess. Um, I've shared it through an email link already. Let me see, why is it not doing this? Um, presenter view, start slide. Let me see if I can do it this way. Sorry, that's not working. Okay. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, here, why don't I see if I can share it? So I've shared it with Isabel. She has access to it. Isabel, if you're able to, I can let you share it. Um, I don't know why my machine, I've had trouble with my machine of late. Shared a file in the meeting. All right. There it is. So can I do it this way? It's loading. She shared it through the chat. I don't know if that's going to help. <laughs> okay, I, I have opened it. So I'm going to share it. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind. I don't know what All happened right. on my end, but it wouldn't give me the usual options. Thank you, Beth. Okay. You're welcome. Beautiful. There it is. Okay, we can start. Um, Just well, tell so, me when to advance. I'll sure, try I certainly that. will do so. But for now, we'll have my. I'll, I'll introduce myself quickly and have Isabel introduce herself, um, because she's the star in some ways. Going to tell you about the most exciting frontline work that's going on that I think relates well to your work and social determinants of health. I uh, have been running this center since we founded it back in 2013. Uh, I got my PhD at University of California, Berkeley. Um, I have been working, done consulting work before coming to Williams when uh, I started as the coordinator of experiential education. And um, in my work at Berkeley, I was trained in political science, public administration, public policy, and political behavior, which has proven very helpful for me both here at Williams and thinking about the wider community. Uh, but I'll talk more about the way we think about things here at CLIA after uh, Isabel gets the chance to introduce herself. Izzy? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, my name is Isabel Arbello. I'm a junior at Williams College, majoring in statistics uh, with a concentration in public health. Um, and I was really just drawn to these fields because I'm really excited about using data-driven analysis to make sense of complex situations and provide solutions for healthier, safer, more sustainable living. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to share a little bit more about the research we've been working on this past year and hope to continue to build upon in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, Isabel. Okay, so we've got that opening slide. You can move to slide number two. Thank you. Um, so a little bit about us as an enterprise. Um, we were founded in 2013, uh, combining the experiential uh, curricular side of work at Williams, where I was orig originally housed, with the extracurricular work at Williams, doing community engagement in an effort to uh, make the work stronger, to do a better job, to consolidate Rolodexes, if you remember that expression from years ago. Um, we have a tripartite responsibility. We are uh, responsible for cultivating and sustaining experiential opportunities, as I said, both curricular and non-curricular, extracurricular, in the service of the teaching goals of our faculty, the civic aspirations of our students, and the needs of the wider community. And all three have to stay in our sites at all times. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we take a holistic, collaborative, and continuous learning approach in the work with faculty, student groups, and the community organizations, as well as campus partners, who we try to rope in to do the same kind of work that we're doing, or to, to organize their own activities that we can then help with. And the aim is to get students good hands-on learning opportunities to address pressing civic problems. Um, we frankly do whatever it takes. If that means getting particular kinds of trainings for students, such as trauma-informed education practices and raising awareness about uh, social determinants of health, that's what we do. Um, we, we arrange whatever kind of training makes sense. Uh, we try to find out from students what they want. We also look to faculty to see what they think students need. And all of this, is not just an aim to help them when they get out, but to help them get the kind of practical experience they need in order to be able to theorize and think about policy uh, as they go through the rest of their academic experience here at Williams. And as I state here, we also follow the guidelines outlined in Stanford University's Ethical and Effective Principles of Service, which are eight separate categories. I could send a link to people if they want Brian, it, but it's that. available online. Yeah. Um, really, uh, encouraging people, and we follow this, to think in terms of everything from humility, reciprocity, thinking about if everyone can mute themselves, that would be sorry? terrific. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, if everyone can mute themselves, that would be terrific. Sure, thanks. But I understand we've had uh, it's understandable if there's a, an issue now and again. Um, so in terms of our, our work, uh, we think very carefully. And I suppose if you have to give one word that describes what we do, it's that we listen intently and continuously. Um, these days, especially with conditions changing so rapidly, it's really, really important for us to continue listening, to hear our community partners, to hear the folks, to listen carefully to the folks that are getting the help from our students to the extent that it's help, um, but to listen very, very deeply, to understand what the challenges are that people face, um, how those challenges are changing. And certainly with COVID, the changes have been dramatic and that's required us to adapt fairly rapidly. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'm about to give you an overview uh, just really quickly of the ways we engage. But before I do that, to follow on with a little further the, the language of, of ethos, um, when we keep in mind the health and welfare of our constituencies, we are simultaneously aiming to increase their awareness of the challenges that everybody else is facing. Um, I often say to people, it's always more complicated than you think. And it's not that we wanna scare people or students particularly away from the complexity, but help them to learn to navigate the complexities and help them be able to be, you might call it more surgical in their understanding, think in careful ways of slicing and dicing the challenges so you can do a better job of helping the folks or working in partnership with the folks on the front lines. Um, COVID certainly has brought these into sharp relief, as I mentioned, in the face of both necessary isolation and low levels of institutional and social trust, um, the community building has been even more important and much more difficult than people used to even think. Um, luckily, as you'll see from what Isabel talks about in a little bit, our students are hungry to do the difficult work and have stepped up to take on the challenges in whatever form available, remote, virtual, or hybrid. So we're viewing the different ways we're engaging. Um, there's four, four um, areas I'd like to highlight, the types of work available and the levels of involvement, the opportunities in a dozen action areas, some options and impacts, and then after we hear about Isabel and the work that she's doing, the impact she and her team are already having. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the scale of engagement, do a little bit of a wrap up, and we'll take some questions from you all. Next slide. Okay, so we think in terms of the work available, we wanna make sure that students have multiple entry points. You don't have to decide that you're gonna get paid work with our office, though you can. You don't have to decide you're gonna get academic credit. You can volunteer, you can do summer internships. We think across a broad spectrum of ways to engage so that whenever a student comes to us, to any of us, including our student leaders and student staff, when a student comes and says, I'm interested in X, Y, or Z, we feel compelled, we feel the responsibility to find something for them. Okay, to make sure that there is a pathway for them to get on. They can get started doing pretty much anything in any area they want. And so we think in terms of these on this uh, right side, the 
different types of involvement. So we want open drop-in opportunities. And some of the examples I can give of those would be, we have what's called the RAPS program, Williams Recovery of All Perishable Surplus, where you can just pop in on the days that, the, that people are organizing this and go and help recover food from dining services that was made but not served, pre prep it to be frozen and to be distributed. And you can help with distribution in the community in, into housing communities or um, programs where folks are in need of food. And that could be anything from some of the low-income housing communities, some of the elder communities, or some of the community work that's happening um, in terms of student programming. So there's a program called Playwright Mentoring, where we now have folks organizing, collecting food even from different nonprofits to make sure that the food is there. So when the kids in that program who are usually kids of very limited means and of challenged circumstances, they can either eat there or bring home a frozen meal or some meals to their family. So the idea is to be part of that system. You can just drop in and help and then learn more. Uh, that's one example of the kind of open drop-in involvement we arrange. There's one-time events like the Great Days of Service that are run by the Lehman Community Engagement Group. And we support those student organizations setting up those kinds of special events. We help identify the kind of one-time activities that might be done. That might be helping paint the house of someone who is uh, disabled and can't manage the funds to get someone to do that for them, or helping with rearranging or moving things for people, as well as outdoor work. Sometimes folks have cleared out the yards of people who've either become in, unable to do so or just financially unable to get the support they need. Then there's weekly, monthly, and seasonal work. A lot of our weekly work, in fact, most of it that's paid is work in the local schools in a variety of capacities. Students can teach, tutor, and mentor. I'll tell more about those examples a little bit later. A lot of those opportunities, there's also monthly options like um, read aloud programs in the schools and then seasonal opportunities that will occur over the summer, over winter, or in the fall when there's activities that need help in our community. And that could be an outdoor education program that needs support or needs students to help mentor the people who are getting support. Um, the winter study and summer internships, we sponsor and support a lot of winter study courses where students can do field work in the community. Um, we also support uh, students doing summer internships by identifying community partners they can work with. They can get funds through other offices as well as our own to do research. Um, and we also run a training program over the summer. The winter study courses range widely from things like teaching kids in elementary school about genetics, um, to uh, fieldwork courses like the one that Isabel participated in to do her fieldwork in public health. Uh, we try to again provide a range of options, ensuring that whatever a student wants to do in whatever way they want to do it, we can find something that fits for them. So we think, I suppose you could say it's a contingency model. Um, we don't think in terms of we have a set things you have to adapt to us. We think in terms of adapting to a student to try to figure out what way we can make it possible for them to advance their learning, their experiential learning, and then fit that into the rest of their learning trajectory at Williams. Next slide. So I mentioned a dozen action areas. This is the way we kind of segment to try to make sure that we've got the coverage we need. If we don't run a program in these areas, activism, arts and culture, at-risk youth, education, if we don't run something specifically in these areas, we make sure that we've got ways for students to get engaged in work that the community is already doing. So we find the hosts. So we take seriously each of these areas. We want to make sure that if a student is excited about that work, we will either have something already functioning that we can direct them to, find, make sure there's a partner on campus that's running something that they can work with, or we literally work with community organizations to figure out what would make sense for them. So we take very much an individual support uh, approach to this so that, again, no matter what the student comes to us asking about, we can help them find a pathway that will make sense for them. That might be helping them come up with a winter study option where they're going home to work with a community organization home that fits the, the area of interest that they have and will give them the experience that they're looking for. Next slide. 
Okay, some options and impacts. There's a lot to, to, to give you here, but um, I, I just give a few of these as examples because this is the kind of work that we've done and help students do. Um, we do a lot of organizing, teaching, tutoring, and mentoring in the schools in large part because you can't just walk into a school these days and offer your services. Um, they really need people to follow their protocols. Um, we really make sure that we've got good partnerships with them. And that usually means when it's a very stable, long-term relationship, we've got protocols that students have to follow. When COVID struck, we quickly modified our protocols and student uh, sort of contracts with the schools and with us to make clear that if you're gonna do something online, you've gotta follow certain kinds of protocols. As you might imagine, students might be thinking, great, I'll go online in a Zoom call. Well, have you checked your background? Is anything there problematic? Um, how are you communicating? How's your setup in terms of audio and the like to make sure people are understanding you? So we want to we want to make sure that the protocols that are of concern are followed by our students and by our teams. And frankly, when we did that, we quit, we scrambled and looked for best practices at other institutions. Bigger places like the University of Michigan already had a lot of online protocols. So we were not ashamed. We acknowledged there what where we got the information. We we're not ashamed to go and find out what other people are doing and borrow their best practices so that we can learn from them and stand on their shoulders instead of reinventing the wheel. That has been uh, our mantra for a long time now because we don't have time to start from scratch and we wanna take advantage of what's been created across the board in other schools and programs like ours and folks doing more sophisticated work like you all that we can reach out to to learn about best practices, including that fantastic Health Matters curriculum, which we are already just mining, uh, and just really excited about and helping our students learn by looking at your work as examples. So these other examples, helping low-income taxpayers file for refunds, we train students in a winter study course, they volunteer in the spring, they get a free meal, we do it online when, when we are doing this in person. Um, um, we've had to do it remotely last year, and this year it's a little hybrid, but this year we're still on track to get maybe as much as those refunds we've gotten in past years with, with a larger number of clients. Um, we're excited about being able to sustain this program. It hasn't been easy, but our students have stepped up to help, and this year probably is the worst most confusing year for income taxes. And I say this having worked on, having led this program for about 15 years. So these are challenging times and yet our students keep stepping up. So it really, it fills me with pride to think that they don't, they, they don't bat an eyelash when we say it's complicated, let's do this. Um, the, the clients have really been stressed out, but our students have been tremendous help in getting them through this, these difficult periods. Um, inmates, uh, when we had, especially in the, a tutoring realm, students weren't able to go because the House of Correction couldn't let anybody in, but they quickly pivoted in this program. Um, we're back in person now, but during the worst of the pandemic, they basically generated little tutorials, online video tutorials for certain sections of the high set test to help people work through these issues. What's really exciting about that is that we've worked with the adult basic education people, and now we're able to share those same tutorial videos to the wider community, and we'll keep doing things like that. Use in one area can often mean you can use these things in another. And to step back to think in terms of teaching and mentoring, one of the other developments during COVID, which I'm particularly proud of, is that we rallied some students who were keenly interested in working on racial justice in the racial justice area, they worked totally remotely to create new curriculum that addressed racial justice problems in K-12 curriculum. We're still working on getting a lot of that curriculum material online through a regional online network so that teachers all over the districts, all over Berkshire County, but folks outside can look at these materials and draw on them. There's more certainly stuff out there, but in terms of adapting to the Common Core standards and making sure that folks have added good material, our students have really done some amazing creative work. I can tell more about that if people are interested. But when I hear about you all talking about the need for more curriculum, it makes me think, wow, I would love it if some of the curricular best practices you all are finding are the kind of things that we can look at and even then encourage our students once you develop a model for how to look at this kind of challenge the way we've done with the racial justice k-12 education it seems to me you can then invite others in a kind of a 
what they call, you know, open source. What kind of materials have people done out there? How can we bring them to a central location so that others don't have to reinvent the wheel? Teachers on the front lines, clinicians on the front lines can draw on this material and we can build a kind of a groundswell of of improvement that it's just really hard to do when everybody's siloed. But in opening these things up, and especially you all with your, with your fantastic protocols and guidelines, it just feels like we could encourage more folks to join you in these, in these missions that you've got related to improving the quality of, of treatment, of, of training, especially on the part of clinicians. And finally, the one on basic optometry, Unfortunately, that one has gone a little bit stalled because Nicaragua has some real political problems, but folks are working on shifting to new locations to do similar kinds of mobile eye care clinics in other rural areas where uh, you know, these resources are just not available. Some of us are thinking about the potential to do these things domestically because there's certainly parts of this country where people don't have access to decent optometry uh, services. So we are always thinking about how to go to the next level. And it's our students that push us in this thinking because they have the energy and the, the, the willingness to do the work. Next slide, please. Great. So these are just some images from some of the things we've done. We can move quickly through these. And at the end of these little images, this is the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. Um, the two students on the right are supporting uh, the client on the left who didn't mind us taking her picture. Students have helped with simple things like moving the Berkshire Immigration Center, Immigrant Center rather. Um, next slide, please. Um, creative projects, a student group called Be Fair Buddies has been uh, just uh, going gangbusters and working with the folks in some of the group homes in our region that are run by Berkshire families and individual resources, which is the organization that assists uh, and has programming for adults with disabilities. Um, it's a wonderful organization. They do great work. And our students have built some amazing relationships and really have had a lot of fun. And frankly, and this is something I think when we think about community building, um, I have to say that one of the reasons why this work is so valuable and so rewarding for those of us who do it is because our students benefit and we know and they know, they benefit tremendously from these relationships outside of the campus. This can be a high pressure institution a lot of times. And students feel like the next person, the person next to you is always smarter than you, always knows more. And you yourself are thinking, wow, you know, uh, you can be so self-critical. We have students that strive, but they also are intense. And being able to engage in another community, to be in community with other people who are not looking at you at some, looking at you as someone who's like, you're not doing that well in that class, are you? You don't look so good these days, do you? People who are feeling, who feel and appreciate our students for who they are and our students appreciating them for who they are. And together they develop projects, fun projects, rewarding social projects, rewarding creative projects where everybody can feel very good about what they've done. And what you see there in that image is some little snowmen that were made and one of these creative projects that was done just before the holidays. And everybody thoroughly enjoyed the experience. And our student leaders who organized this have said, you know, all our students come back feeling so much better. They get so much more from the experience of working with these folks than they give. And it's that kind of reciprocation and mutual benefit that we're always striving for. And it's huge because it gives students a perspective on a world outside of what can be a pressure cooker here at Williams. Similarly, the Making Mittens Drive, we had um, and starting in January, we had some students, we gathered some material, we got a bunch of sewing machines, we taught students how to sew in some cases, and they were making little fleece mittens, and we gathered other supplies for kids at some local elementary schools who are in dire need of warm clothing. The teachers are telling us they're outside at recess without anything on their hands, and they can't go out when they don't have ski pants when it's snowy. So this is a response to a need, but students learning skills and also enjoying themselves greatly, gathering together in a social enterprise, a social experience that, that fills them up, gives them skills and helps them feel better about the community that they're supporting. Next slide. 
And then finally, we have students who teach science in the local schools and other students who've organized community cleanups in the region whenever folks are asking for it. Again, teaching people how to use loppers and other kinds of tools. Not many people have done so in the past. And so these become opportunities to build skills. Um, we listen to students when they ask for skill building. We also listen to organizations when they want skills built or they want students with skills to do certain kind of project work. And what you're gonna hear next, next slide, will be from Isabel telling you about the project that she worked on that has been working on since the beginning of winter study. So I'll, I'll let her take it away to tell you about what she's been up to. Isabel? Thank you, Paula. Um, thank you everyone again for having me here today. Um, <clears throat> I guess just to jump right in, as I mentioned before, I'm a public health concentrator at Williams and part of the curriculum um, is a field-based experience with a research component to connect what we learn in the classroom to interactions and dynamics in the real world. Um, and when deciding what I wanted to do for my experiential learning component, um, I didn't really have any connections in the public health realm. So I was advised to reach out to Dr. Consolini at CLIA and she shared an exciting idea to develop a health coach program at Williams. Um, and with, the, with in mind to have students work closely with local public health actors to address health disparities in the community. Um, and since I was struggling to find a fieldwork opportunity, I was excited about the potential to build a more organized fieldwork opportunity for William students to ensure that everyone interested is able to observe the interrelationship of individual and social choices with demographic and biological factors that um, affect health and specifically in our local context. And developing this program will allow students to build on the work of those before them and really allow Williams to make a long term commitment to improving health outcomes. Instead of having individual students work in silos on many of the same issues on different projects throughout the years. So during the month of January, um, students are given time to immerse themselves in an interest of their choosing through different classes projects hands on learning. So the project I was a part of took the form of winter study course and it was organized as a task force. Uh, so we broke up into smaller teams um, with individual work streams of about two to four people. And we all met once a week over Zoom as a collective group and sort of um, talked about what we found that week and how to move forward from there. Um, and ultimately the overarching objective to improve health outcomes for underserved population in the Berkshires is really general and, and quite the ambitious tasks. Um, so we're primarily focused on understanding what could be possible in terms of a student health worker role at Williams and specifically the constraints and challenges, challenges that would impede successful implementation. So I spent the bulk of my time identifying and interviewing community health workers and potential institutional partners to learn more about existing programs and resources that could equip Williams students with the skills and knowledge to engage in this type of work. And for me personally, this was the most open ended project I had ever been a part of. And given that there were no obvious steps or guidelines, um, we was really on each and every one of us to reflect on on each interview and every finding and determine if and how it was relevant to the broader goals of the project and how it could guide us towards a logical next step. And exercising this type of critical thinking really forced us to ask like the so what and, and where do we go from here sorts of questions. And that made the experience all the more meaningful and, and really helped us tailor it to the needs that we identified um, and the demand for student volunteering and work. So the biggest obstacles we identified throughout the month were integrating health coaches with care teams that are already really overwhelmed and understaffed and also trying to reconcile the inevitable transients of undergraduate students with the crucial role of building trust with patients and organizations over time. Um, and another sort of caveat was that many of the people on the task force were actually dropped from another course. So um, things were definitely a little bit destroyed in the beginning, people were in different time zones, but even with all those complications, um, we were still able to research major pain points in the local healthcare system, certify a group of students in basic life support and first aid, identify potential institutional partners, research existing health coach, project, existing health coach programs, and bring this all into an executive summary, which also was a great exercise of reflection and really helped us synthesize um, what we had found and leave sort of uh, a document so that whoever picks this project up next could sort of build upon what we had found. Um, and we really thought that whatever form this health coach or this health coach program takes on, ensuring that there's continuity over the years is really crucial to its success. So right now we're really trying to lay down the foundation for a positive pipeline of public health research and work to operationalize community health outreach at Williams. So students are able to gain practical and professional experience and really appreciate the real world challenges inherent in public health 
whether that be understanding like how long it takes people to get back, like different um, like rotating staff, like especially with COVID, there's a lot of more restraints on the healthcare system. So experiencing those um, complications firsthand was really eye-opening for the team. Um, and one of the populations we identified where we really believe Williams students could make a meaningful impact on health outcomes without necessarily needing to be directly involved with direct care delivery is individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and this objective is actually what led me to contact Dr. Sisirak and Dr. Marks about the Health Matters program. And just we wanted to learn about the curriculum and how we could draw from their research to train Williams students to put on health promotion programming for individuals with IDD. Um, so building off this work that I was a part of during winter study, I'm now um, working in coordination with the local human service agency, Be Fair. And we wanna start on a small scale, but just putting on a field day um, to engage individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in an, after, in an afternoon of fun um, and physical activity. And our plan from there is to then gather feedback from volunteers, the Be Fair staff program participates to reflect and assess the event so that we can tweak on it and build upon it for next year. Um, and the, the idea behind this is that we don't think a program of this nature can really be built on a year, but using feedback with students that helped with the event, we can adjust the curriculum used to train them. And ultimately, we want this to evolve into a menu of comprehensive health programming so that we can really build healthy habits in beef for residential homes regarding nutrition and different types of movement. Um, but all in all, this opportunity has really helped me gain firsthand insight into what it's really like to coordinate with different actors in the public health sphere. Um, and I'm really excited about the potential for Williams students to engage with the Berkshire community um, to both make a meaningful impact on health outcomes and also gain experience that will prepare students and inform their decision to work in public health after graduation. Um, and yeah, that sort of sums up the work I've been working on uh, and sort of where we're going from here, but I'm really excited about it. Um, CLIA has been such a great resource for all public health students that um, wanna engage with this work. Um, and yeah, I'll pass it back to Dr. Consolini now. Okay, great. Thanks, Isabel. As you can see, there's uh, incredible power in the, in the energy and the, the work ethic of uh, Isabel and her team. Um, very proud of her and all of them for the great work that they're doing and for the work that this will help uh, build over time. So uh, the next slide before we take questions um, is just a little bit of the numbers, of the scale of our engagement. Um, and then uh, is, um, Beth has already shared with you the, our website and email address. So I think you've got that information, but since time is short, I think we'll move quickly to see if anyone has any questions or observations from what we've shared. This is Heidi. I'm really glad that you talked about um, COVID and how you had to adapt because in Minnesota, um, the disability community really got turned upside down. And so we had to be creative, you know, and we also talked about this at another meeting about um, if there's ever tornadoes or floods and all this kind of stuff. So think about that when you do your teaching. Um, that you're looking at all angles with people with different kinds of disabilities in the community, because the community might be able to help us as we might be able to help them. It's not just a one-way street. And so they need to know that we're not just, you know, I, you know, once I get a certain help, maybe when I'm there, I can give you other types of help, you know, and be a part of the community. I just can't drive to that location. So just think about that when you do your teaching, because um, they say this is probably going to be the norm for the future, you know, weird things are going to happen and we're going to have to live with it. And then if you can keep teaching outside the box, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great suggestions. So, so we are one, I, I don't, for those of you, I know, um, some of you have to get off, but would you, Paula and Isabel be able to, um, stay on a few minutes longer to answer any questions? Um, I thought sure, your presentation I was awesome. Um, as I put in the chat, I think I what I really still love is how clear is moving health beyond the individual level of licensed healthcare provider to really addressing those social determinants of health and what we see in the, with the Hartford Foundation, the four M's of age-friendly environments. I think it's applicable to disability-friendly environments. And one of the first things is what matters. And as I looked at your picture, that, that's really what you're doing is seeing what's, what matters and how 
um, those social determinants of health within a community, team-based um, um, or community academic partnership, team-based collaborative um, role can, can build something that's sustainable over time. So I really thank you for your work. I think it's incredible. Thank Question. You. I'm yeah. sorry, this is, this is the interpreter. I just wanna let you know that um, I have to leave. <clears throat> so there will be no uh, interpreting after this point. Sorry. Okay. okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Wonderful you. to have you. Um, so did you have any question? Um, I don't um, I don't have a specific question. I'm impressed by the work. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, uh, maybe I'll come up with one. Keep That's on. You. you don't have to. I'm impressed. I, I really want to hear the results of your research, of your review, because I'm impressed with that. I find that fantastic. Um, yeah, we're, um, we're exciting. We're excited to be able to do this work. And thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, I'd love to, if you don't have questions, I've got more questions for you. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Is that all right? But I want to wait if anybody has a question. No. Okay. Um, so I, I uh, just want to say, oh, not to, I just want to say, I'm glad this, um, I think more colleges should do this. I know my niece is in neuroscience, you know, Mm -hmm. and is doing similar, like going out in the community and picking a project. But, mm -hmm. and I told her I can be her guinea pig if she ever needs me for schoolwork mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because it's perfect. And so um, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can expand your idea and put them into other schools and really get them to see the real stuff because sometimes sitting behind a desk and just sitting in a room doesn't mean a whole lot. It, once you're interacting with other people or actually getting your hands a little dirty and then you can decide I'd rather them to know now than find out later and then we lose a, a person that's burnt out or lose somebody at least they know what they're getting themselves into you know and got some kind of idea because this is going to be it, it seems like from going forward it's going to be tough but we can do it if we put it together correctly, whatever correctly means, mm -hmm. and go forward. So you're, you're the stepping point of making it work. If we can get other colleges on board, if you can spread it across the United States, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Well, that's certainly something we'll certainly share widely. And we have a great alumni network as well. So once we tell the stories about what folks are doing, using some of the great work that you've already created, then hopefully this, this word spreads. And as you say, people working in different institutions decide they could try to do this. But I, I've been, uh, I know Isabel has been too, she had to take off, but um, the, but your, your curriculum is just fantastic. And the idea that students can then look at that and then judge, hmm, maybe where, where else could this happen? And this, this is something we've learned over time. Certainly I've learned over time. And this is something, um, certainly with William students, sometimes people come in and think, I know, I wanna do something at the national level. I oh. wanna find out what's going on in national government, particularly. And then what they don't quite realize is the innovation is not it's happening up level. there. Right. It's happening at the level at the level that you all are at, and it's then a question of us. Frankly, we thought about this for the la for the four years of you know what. But anyway, thinking well, if there's not going to be any guidance or leadership up above, why are we waiting? Why do we wait for someone to show up? Hmm. Let's do the work. Let's find the people. And this is what it, Isabel found you all because you were exactly what she needed to find. If we can do more of this kind of partnering across, I know we're all way too busy. But if we can do this and especially excite this younger generation to take some of this responsibility, they can be the ones. And some of them are gonna go off to medical school and say, why aren't, why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we getting training in this area? There used to not be nutrition training in medical school, remember? Some people know this. Um, now yeah. they're putting it in, it's probably still too slow. But, um, but this idea of making sure that the appropriate training is getting there. And when we've got these models like the ones you've created, uh, I think we can go further. And I'd love to see, again, you're talking about training for clinicians and the like, and looking at what's missing. Um, when you find the gaps and you decide you're starting to fill them, let's spread the word about the way you're filling them. And those of us who are like-minded and allies can share in our regions as well, in our community. 
The students and can I, be I, the vectors for that. And just to let you know really quickly, and my other niece, they're in the same family, um, same mom and dad, you know, my brother's kids. Um, it's gonna be an engineer. So you're you're right on the right track. I got two two young generations that want to make a difference in the world. So we have to figure out how to keep them motivated. So your type of program will certainly help those types of thinkers. Thank you. And, and, uh, and Paula, you, you answered my one question in terms of a new generation of young people coming out of Williams who may end up in nursing school, medical school, and they will have had this experience. And I, I wonder if you have any other thoughts on how we can really move, particularly healthcare professional, to, to operationalize the Ottawa Charter of 1986. So it's a little mm -hmm. old. We haven't done such a good job. But, but the Ottawa Charter essentially said health is an everyday resource and it should be done. But we should look at health where people live, learn, work, play, and pray. And that's what you are, you all are doing so well. But we really, and, and particularly in the U.S., because we don't have primary health care, we have primary care. But how do we move that bar of of doing the community academic partnership like you're doing to address social determinants of health? Mm. No, it's a good question. Um, I think uh, uh, you know we. I, I think what we're trying to do, and of course. It, COVID slowed us all down because everything was so uncertain in terms of how you can behave. And so I think we have to remember that it's still going to take a little longer to get back up and running for a lot of these institutions the way we did because people feel a certain sense of burnout. So right there, I, we want to show understanding and compassion because things are going to go more slowly. I have to tell myself that sometimes every day. Um, but, but when we start to think of coming out, and I, I'm jokingly, not completely jokingly, say, you know, we were all shot into space. Now we're coming back down, but re-entry from space, you can burn up in the atmosphere. People are burning up. We've got to be understanding. Um, but as we start to get our bearings and start to understand how we're all changed, I think what you're saying, this, this approach, the Ottawa Charter, is more relevant than ever. Um, and what we're thinking, and this is something, one of the reasons why I prodded the students to do, to focus on health coaching, is because I think that is an area where um, there's room for young people to learn more about the needs to uh, get skilled in understanding how to help people um, and to be these kind of connectors, social connectors, whether it's in person or online. And learning, frankly, we learned about a program at Worcester College of Ohio. Um, I think I told you about that, Beth, very impressive program um, where they had nursing students doing this kind of work in the community. I think it was mostly with elders. Um, but more of this kind of programming is starting to be done where people are helping people with day-to-day -day challenges, like how do you take your own blood pressure? And folks helping coach in those areas, but also being social connectors, I think can make a difference. When we, we have things like community health worker programs, but there's just still these other gaps and room for people to participate and help. And when you are training people well enough to do that, I think you can open this up more in a way that makes that gives people that empowers young people to see the challenges to also help with those challenges um and that also does more of what you're talking about but in general my answer to a question like that is to for us all to remember there's no one magic way to do it okay you can't wave a wand it's got to be these mixes of things right step various steps so if you think hate to use a war metaphor but advance on multiple fronts <clears throat> and see where you can uh, go so I, I do have a question yeah because it seems to me you do have institutional buy-in at Williams, whereas yeah. sometimes, I, and I, that's a very real question for us, because I know I, in many ways, I, I work at Rush, Rush has whatever, we have an ADA task force. Nevertheless, sometimes I feel like my work is sort of, work I get involved in is sort of like guerrilla warfare. We're doing it, even though the, the top, whatever, the, they, they may say they support it, but they don't really know what we're up to, and maybe sometimes <laughs> that's just as well. You know, because you do it and you ask for permission later. So how how do you kind of go about getting that institutional buy-in, or how did okay. how did that um, work for you? Okay, it's a it's actually a lot of what you're doing too, um, and it's one of those things. And what I what mostly it's about is 
trying to remind them at every, in a nice way without hitting them over the head too hard, how valuable this is, certainly to our students, to the wider communities who help them. They'll, and like you, like your institution, they'll go, oh yes, we support it, we support it. And frankly, we, the place is well endowed, so we get more support than other places have, but we still have our challenges because it's still, I hate to say it, but sometimes it is, it does feel like an afterthought. You know, you're stressed out, you're busy with everything else, but by the way, so making this case, Thank you for those remarks. Making the case is always the challenge. Finding the ways, and I frankly, I listen a lot to who's who, and I try to find ways, and this might be something you could do too. I try to find ways for our leadership to see on the front lines what's going on, okay? To get them, if, if we talk about these drop-in activities, but to have them come to some meeting, come to some event. Most recently, there's a read aloud program um, started because a particular school in our region elementary school had a lot of trouble. As you might have noticed, some of you coming back to school oh, has yeah. been hard for kids. Um, they weren't that socialized if they were young in the first place. They came back and then we started to see bad behavior. Well, consider, you know, inappropriate behavior by little kids saying something racist to someone, not knowing what the heck they were saying. It's, but it's coming from home, right? We were isolated and we we're a polarized, low trust society these days. So all that stuff just showed up back in the schools. So we are working with a community organization that's working with these, the school district down um, in Pittsfield. And so then we want read alouds. So now I'm not just asking students to go down and do these read alouds. I'm asking staff, I'm saying, you're a Dean, would you like to come down? So looking for frankly, any little opportunity that might bring these folks, get them engaged. One of the reasons that helps is when a Dean or someone else is in a bigger meeting, or even the president of the college who came to our, before COVID struck, she was new president here, she came to the graduation at the jail in our Inside Out course. Um, and she was moved to tears, we all were, because one of the fellows who works at the jail who organizes on their end um, was just very moved by the fact that we have this class for the inmates and our students. It's a joint course inside the jail. Um, so she didn't expect that I was going to be, she was like, we're all moved to tears. Like, I didn't expect that. I didn't go in thinking I was going to be moved. Sure, because you sort of kind of, you know, figure that you check a box kind of thing. So we think again on an advance on multiple front strategy, we're asking for money, we're understanding. Of course, you need more money for crisis counseling. You can't give it to us. We get that. But then we try to remind them that this is better than crisis counseling because students are getting experience that grounds them and helps them feel full, feel like a full human being and not as stressed out by some of the stressors that occur at the college. So we try multiple avenues and I try to keep all of those open, you know, inviting senior people and other staff so that everybody knows about what's going on as much by personal experience as anything, nothing more powerful. Um, we work with alums as much as we can. Um, and we, with all this online stuff, we realize that we should do more. When you do the online stuff, it's more documented. It's there for people to see. Okay. So we want to try to do more of that too. And something that comes to mind too. So and now I think of some of the stuff you've done already. And I think, hmm, could we find people, students perhaps, or others who could find little things they could do. Just translate the curriculum that you've got in Spanish, let's say. Okay, Have we got people doing that? Could we find them to do that? Then we think about, we could pay students to do it. We could get volunteers to do it. We could think about joint grants with, with organizations to do more of this kind of stuff. So we're looking for any little piece and trying to direct students in those areas. If somebody's got a talent that might make sense. So you can reach out to other academic departments or to various folks and say, gee, anybody looking for something? And sometimes there's students that are hungry to do this kind of stuff that can make a huge difference. Then videotape the stuff. If you've got somebody doing a lesson, have them videotape the lesson. And that's powerful too, because you can put that up on YouTube. We can link to it. And a little piece like that doesn't seem that big. But when you do it, it's a model. And if you can find some way to do something like, again, a you need somebody to organize this, but some kind of an open source thing, like a Wikipedia page, where you're saying, these are some best practices in terms of clinical help. And then we try to, a bunch of us in different parts of the country, try to say to people, did you see their stuff? Your clinicians should do this. One example of something we did, and it was a weird roundabout way of doing it, but I had, a, um, I got an inquiry from the um, 
from the Bay State Education, Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, their education director. They wanted to know about the poverty simulation that we run, because I bought the kit. We ran it for a while, of course, COVID stopped that. And they said, you know, we have these first year residents. We are interested in uh, social determinants of health. We're trying to change the way we do business. Would you come down and run the simulation for us? And we did, they loved it. After that, they bought their own kit. Now it's part of their training. And it's this idea of having the, 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 the medical professionals, the doctors think to ask all these questions, right? Which gosh, it's new, good. But, but it was one of those things, this was a few years ago before the pandemic, we're like, sure, we'll help you do that. But it's that kind of a place where I could say to them, you know, do you, do you realize what's going on here? And this is, it's funny, but it is about making linkages to projects like yours, programs like yours that represent a huge resource for these people and saying, did you know that this even exists? Um, and then thinking about how you all are moving to the next level, even as you're going further. I think it makes this stuff more usable when someone sees somebody running one of these trainings, running a lesson, okay? Um, even if it's just the part before you have people participate. But I think something like that, video is powerful stuff and can help spread the word in ways because we can all then spread it and say, look at this. And our students in public health can see it. And we can say, do you want to work on something like this? Want to get a grant from us to go help with this program? So after all this, I'll be checking with Beth and saying, hmm, got any projects you can compartmentalize that undergraduates might work on for you? We can be people that you share it with, but then you can share that across other undergraduate institutions and the students there can get excited. The ones that are pre-med or pre-nursing or in nursing programs might decide this is something they want to chew on. With experiential education, very exciting to people these days. It's, it's got a nice, um, got a nice presence and awareness. Um, we, you can be elevating your access to people who want to do these things, build on what you've done. And then you could just say, we're only going to ask you to come back and share what you've created using our stuff. You know, um, going back to your, what you were talking about with your, um, jail mm -hmm. program for the high yeah. school equivalency, Valerie Gruss was on the call earlier. Valerie, um, is the director of the Geriatric Workforce and Enhancement Program. And she has a, a prison um, educational program in Illinois and kind of talking about your comment about COVID, uh, but what she found and her prison program in Illinois is addressing dementia in prison because a lot of prisoners who are in for life acquire dementia and they tend to get, because they can't follow the rules, they tend to get put in isolation. So they're, they're further, you know, right. compromised because that's the last thing they should do. So Valerie with her GWEP, it, it's called Engage, Engage Illinois. Um, and she has been, she sent out a survey a couple of years ago and had 101% response from all of the, um, the, the prison wardens in mm -hmm. Illinois and, and, and there was an extra percent because there was a new prison warden and when he came on, he wanted to take the survey too. Um, but what she found with COVID, and I thought of you, what she found with COVID was that she had to put things online. So she's now able to amplify what she was doing in Illinois on a national level um, because of the, the virtual outreach to it. But I, I love your project with the jail because that addresses the, the education factor, which ultimately, as we know, impacts health. It certainly does. It certainly so I know does. we're well over and I could talk with you for another four hours. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I want to be respectful of your time. Um, and I'll else. be at the local airport tomorrow. I, I think you'll be picking me up, right? <laughs> so we'll continue. Um, but thank you so much. And I, I put your email and website um, in the chat. Um, but if you can't find it, it's the it's right up here. Um, Clea, C L I A at William dot E D U. And yes, Ming, I see you sending something. Oh, I also put in chat um, 
the program that you mentioned at Worcester, it's mm -hmm. the uh, College of Worcester Student Making Health Call as health coaches. Health coaches, um, yes, and they do them in person, I believe, as well as calling. They say, they, yeah, they're assigned and they take a course. It's a brilliant model. I'd love to see us do it, but it's not something we can do right now. We're a little slow to move on something like that. So we're looking at all these other avenues as well. Um, but yeah, there are models out there that we can all look at. And I think make a huge difference in our own region. And the one I'm gonna definitely check out in Gage, Illinois, because we have student groups that are keenly interested in support and help for the incarcerated um, student groups, as well as uh, a group that, that uh, we uh, hire some student leaders to organize. So we've got, I think folks will be very excited about that kind of support that's being provided in ways that, you know, people haven't even imagined that that's out there. This is true. Well and the other thing, the other thing that you had talked about was taking blood pressures, and we we typically think of that as being in the the licensed healthcare provider, but but your approach with the coaches is really thinking about self management of healthcare and how students in you know who are not healthcare professionals can really help with that um, self management, health advocacy, and making those changes. Right. And at the same time, as we know, it's also a connection for someone who's in isolation. COVID made this much worse. But we live in a rural area where many older people especially are feeling isolated, but others with disabilities can also feel isolated. So the idea that someone is kind of a social partner for you as well, they're asking you how you're doing, um, it's, a, it's a great chance to feel a sense of connection. And that's just as important as someone helping you make sure you take the, uh, thank you for that that some, someone can help I you. I just have um, a quick question before yeah. you guys go. Sure. Uh, have you, because you were talking about COVID again, and it got me thinking, have you readapt? Because everything kind of got turned upside down in the healthcare professional from going to the doctors, going to the hospital, from having someone come to your house, going to the hospital, everything, even transportation, you know, got turned upside down. So are you adapting, you know, when these two changes come, um, we have to teach a little differently or we have to talk about this big time so we're not in the dark because it's great that you have, I, I really like your program, but it, it doesn't help if it doesn't know how to sw switch to, oh God, the world's falling apart now. We weren't mm -hmm. taught that, but right. it's kind of in there that there could be floods, there could be tornadoes, there could be right. a pandemic, Absolutely. you know, and are we prepared to help, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and then also you know, are the people around them helping you as they're helping, you know, the students and the whoever, mm -hmm. you know, because it's the community has to help each other. So are you teaching all of that in a way that works, you know, so when they get that license or college education, they're, they're knowing what they're getting themselves into. Sure. We do try and we do work. There's, I'm a member, I'm a volunteer. I don't have much time to volunteer with them. The Medical Reserve Corps, there's uh, something like 900 of those across the country um, where uh, the, the goal is to um, be prepared for these difficulties and to work together in the community and support all folks and finding out what their challenges are. We have had some things like hurricanes and floods in our area. So we, we have learned and COVID taught us to adapt pretty quickly. And a lot of folks that didn't have online skills got them. So we train people along those lines um, as well. But thank you, it's a good point, Heidi, something we have to all keep in mind. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks for these links. Um, I, I have one more link for you. We just did a presentation, had a, or hosted a presentation from the National Arc, the U.S. Arc, and I'm, I'm looking for the, um, it, it's, sorry, it, it's the, the Justice Project. Uh -huh. and, and I, you know how it is when you are like frantically looking. Yes, I know it. You never think <laughs> um, <laughs> you've been there. <laughs> but it, it, it's a good one. They talked about um, abuse, neglect, um, exploitation. Uh -huh. Yes, you know, are you still on? Can you send yeah, the link? I am. I'm sorry. My my uh, connection is super unstable, so hence um, video off. But I'm looking for it. I'll I'll put it in the chat. Great. Um, but it, it's. They, it was really one of our more popular um, presentations. And, uh -huh. and I think they really touched on a topic 
that is woefully absent in any health profession education around the abuse, neglect, exploitation, um, and violence that people with disabilities experience. And um, we, we are looking to sort of amplify the work. And, and I think it's interesting because as you know, with um, the, the Ukraine war, just before I got online, I did a quick search to see how much press there really has been even about you know what's happening with people with disabilities mm. in, in, during the Ukraine war and it's been remarkably very limited work. And so I think you know another topic is the national set thank you, yes, Nina, National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability. And I think a lot of people don't even know that the ARC has been doing this work. Um, mm. is, we'll be putting the presentation online. Um, and, and, and Sarah just mentioned the, the, the other sad statistic that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are overrepresented, particularly uh, Black men in yes. the prison system. And in um, general, it's the largest uh, deliverer of mental health care. I mean, prisons are full yeah. of people who have mental health issues. They're the largest right. mental health care facilities in the country. Yeah, right. they use or, or non-facilities, you know, but yes, right. They're not and providing so it, but know, it's they where the people are that as, are in need. Um, yeah. They use jails as um they yeah. how, you know, they come in and they come out and they go into jails and they use them kind of like the hospitals. They so shut down from, the country. There's a lot of um, states right. that do that. They yep. did, they did. Right. In Cook County, they shut down a bunch of community mental health centers. By the next week, the prison, the jail population went up. Went up, yeah. And yeah. when was that? How long? Because I remember well, that was a, that was two or three years ago. I mean, two, three years all with the statistics, you know, they shut right. down all these centers yeah. for cost yeah. saving, and the jail right. population goes right up. Right. So and I remember all your cost savings. Right. Exactly. In at the end of the Carter administration, there was a plan to close down the terrible warehouses of, uh, you know, for the mentally ill. And then the goal was supposedly to have community health centers replace them. And what happened? Reagan came in, no community health centers. And so we- right, the population goes up. Exactly, exactly. Because where else people don't get the help they need and where do they wind up? Jail. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or hospitals. <laughs> or has, hospitals and then, right. Right. Yeah, and I no, just want to say one thing really side. quickly, because we mentioned Ukraine. Right now, um, Ukraine is working really hard with the people, because I'm adopted, people who weren't adopted, and they ended up in some orphanage, if I'm saying that correctly, you know, like a place where they warehouse, you right. know, the people. Okay, and I was thinking about what about people like me who have disabilities and weren't adopted, you know, and I was thinking about them at the same time we're doing our project, you know, you yeah. know, you, I don't know if you do any international training for people who like to travel, you know, and help save the world, you know, like my two nieces, you know, and so it's something to think about because um, it really because their hospitals have been bombed you know, and a lot of their homes have been bombed and a lot of the places where they need help has been bombed or shut, blown up. So there isn't a lot of help for the disabled. So we're doing this in the United States, but how do we take it further? And, you know, if people can come to the United States and get an education, how can they take it back home and use it, you know, in their country without being, you know, like you can't do that because our laws don't allow it, but there is a way you can, you know, so... Mm -hmm. If I was living in that country, I can still get help, you yeah. know, with my disability. So it's something to think about when you um, spread this out bigger than what I'm thinking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for those comments, Heidi. Appreciate them. Um, I, would, I would respond to Heidi's comments by saying that Georgetown is working with um, uh, Disabilities Rights International and through our Center for Child and Human Development, which is part of the work that we're doing with this group, um, we actually have a team that goes out to certain, well, we've been to Guatemala, Mexico. There's also a linkage with uh, some folks in Kazakhstan who actually have transitional housing for um, adults with um, uh, disabilities, and we're working with the governmental agencies to help improve those sectors 
that for too long have obviously been institutionalized and are now moving towards uh, deinstitutionalization and creating more community-based living, especially in uh, Kazakhstan. We actually have a, a group that's done tremendous work over the last 15 years um, in developing transitional housing to, to community-based living with, uh, uh, the, with adults who have been institutionalized for, for many years. And their success has been tremendous in terms of providing workforce readiness, um, vocational training, uh, and they've really been able to persuade the government that th these uh, that that folks with disabilities have tremendous offerings and can be productive members of society. So they've really done a lot of work in terms of changing the dynamics around in terms of how the government uh, perceives um, and has neglected uh, uh, individuals with disability in that particular country. So. Heidi, there is some work that is, is successfully being done and partnerships that are being made and students can participate uh, in those travels, but it's at their own expense. There's not a scholarship that's uh, um, available to them. And we did have one student who had, was from Guatemala, came to work with me and then went back, especially in terms of individuals who were warehoused in um, mental health uh, institutions, which was quite abysmal and also had disabilities. He has now turned himself around in terms of um, going into more primary care. Uh, as a result of seeing the work that could be done as had been done through partnerships at Georgetown. So it's a small seed at a time, but it's, it's uh, having some wonderful outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah, I just I mainly think that the Ukraine is so having some, so many terrible problems. It's not their fault, it's just the kids. And, and, and I was thinking about the people with disabilities that get warehoused, you know, in a way that they can't take care of themselves. So how do they get the help, you know, that they truly need? And then you got the kids who are not adopted, you know, that have to figure out and they're helping them. It just made me think about, you know, this could really do some good, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you everyone particularly you, Paula. <laughs> I appreciate you giving us your time to share everything. Um, I did the last, my last chat um, text were exactly, universal design and healthcare. Um, colleagues in the disability world were leading the way in terms of thinking about how healthcare institutions could be accessible for people with a variety of disabilities. Um, if you go to the website in Google, you can just hit translate and you can pull down the document. They, they, they've been the only one internationally that I have seen that has really thought about universal design um, in healthcare with the exception of Rush University and Rush with their new hospital, they built their hospital to adhere to universal design principle. Mm -hmm. So... Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to everyone. Thank you for having her. I appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for hosting me. It's exciting to see all the work you're doing. Appreciate yeah. it. Good luck Take to care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. Bye-bye. Hey, Sarah, can we get the, uh, um, the Bye -bye, recording? Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, hey. Sarah, can we get the recording soon? You're on mute. You're still on mute. Yeah. So, uh oh, Sarah just went away. Oh, maybe something was happening with her. Um... I, I...